I'm Ann Dark. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Welcome back to the 83rd episode of It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. On today's episode, we will have an interview with Jocelyn Jackson. Jocelyn's books have been translated into a dozen languages, have won SIBA's Novel of the Year Award, have three times been number one book sense pick have twice won georgia author of the year awards have three times been shortlisted for the townsend prize for fiction and have been a finalist for the willie morris award for southern fiction jocelyn learned to scuba dive in order to write never have i ever and now she and her husband scott are both avid divers they live in decatur georgia with their two kids two entitled cats and a modestly sized dog you never have i ever don't play games you can't afford to lose amy way is proud of her ordinary life and the simple pleasures that come with it teaching diving lessons baking cookies for her neighbors helping her best friend charlotte run their local book club her greatest joy is her family her devoted professor husband her spirited fifteen-year-old stepdaughter and her adorable infant son but amy's sweet uncomplicated life begins to unravel when the mysterious and allure angelica rue arrives on her doorstep one book club night never have i ever explores what happens when the transgressions of our past come back with a vengeance we would like to welcome jocelyn jackson to the program welcome jocelyn hey thank you so much for having me on i really appreciate it well i've seen in several sources that you were called a quote-unquote southern author what does it mean for you to be called a southern author and how do southern authors differ from other authors i didn't start out writing about the south necessarily i actually had to move away from the south i went up to chicago for graduate school and i think at that point i understood how culturally different and how weird we are and so i started paying more attention to my homeland i think that we are a piece of the country that has a very bloody dark history and we rightfully lost a war which gives us kind of a different history and there's all of that stuff is in the water down here i think the past is alive in the present so i think southern writers are usually cognizant of that we have a definite love and loathing our feelings for our homeland are ambiguous and complicated (laughs) so all of that kind of goes into making a southern writer and sense of place is obviously important to me so i don't mind being called a southern writer I, i believe in that old saw write what you know and this is what i know well you did a great job that's for sure and i have to say that even if it wasn't referenced as being the south i would have picked up that vibe it definitely had that vibe yeah i think that's funny because i mean i think it is a southern book i guess in some ways but for me like never have i ever is probably the least southern book i've ever written like i think about in terms of like being influenced by the southern gothic and doing things like the grotesque and presenting characters who are kind of stock characters that you recognize from the south the sweet little old lady the southern belle and then turning that sideways to make a point about social justice. Those are kind of two big hallmarks of Southern Gothic and things that I have done quite a bit in other books. But I think other than the setting, a few, you know, there's a keeping room and the the sense of place is Southern. In terms of theme, this is probably the least Southern, most universal book I've ever written. Huh, very interesting. Speaking of characters, we have interviewed lots of authors that tell us that pretty much the characters in the book start writing themselves. You have made that comment also. Could you explain that to our listeners? 
Oh, sure. You know, it sounds so (laughs) woo-woo. Oh, my characters tell me what to do. And it's obviously, it's not true. Like, they don't. I'm doing it. It's just coming from the underdark, you know, of my mind. It all comes out of the subconscious. And so experientially, that is what it feels like. In fact, I know a book has started working when my characters begin doing things that don't feel like they're coming from me. When they are doing things that actively make me uncomfortable, I know I found my way to the meat of the book. And I think, like, for me, it's just a matter of riding enough to access, because all the good books live down in the dark and salty reaches of our mental illness, our histories, (laughs) our wounds, our horrors, our deepest, most secret loves. And so you just have to, like, write your way down to that place to where it feels like they are taking over. Really, it's you doing it, but it, it just doesn't feel like you. So it's a trick you play on yourself to access the part of your mind where the books live. Ah, so what gave you the idea to write such an amazing book about a childhood game? (laughs) Well, I love games. It's not the first time games have appeared in my books. I go to the theater a lot. I'm a theater person. I love plays that have games in them where you see people playing games or movies or TV shows. I love books where people play games because it's such a human thing to do. We invent games almost one of the first things we do when we have any leisure time. When we get out of survival mode, we begin finding ways to entertain ourselves. I mean, they found fossils of dice and stick games that are (laughs) back from the dawn of man. So I think it's a very human thing to do. And it's a really basic way to tap into that reptile brain. We win, we lose. It's an immediate stakes raiser. So, uh, you know, like in Gods in Alabama, there's tons of games. In the Almost Sisters, they play online Scrabble. It's how he courts her is playing words with friends. And in this book, I sort of let my penchant and my fondness for games be the jumping off point and frame this cat and mouse game that Amy way enters into with this new woman who has come to her book club. You mentioned the book club, and I have to say, I thought that was a great backdrop for this book. Just curious, do you have or know of a book club that you base this on? Well, I've been in a lot of book clubs. I'm in one now. Right now, I used to be in two, but my neighborhood book club has kind of dissipated. It fell apart recently. The woman who organized it, uh, her kids got a little older, and she went back to work, and nobody has stepped up to run it yet. But I hope, I hope someone will soon. And I'm in a classics book club where we meet about every six weeks and we read a book that's at least 50 years old that won a major award or is still being studied in universities. So I I like book clubs, but I think the reason I wanted to start it at a book club, like here's Amy who has this fantastic life, right? She loves her husband. She has a new baby she's crazy about. She actually gets along with her teenage stepdaughter. And what is safer Then your own house hosting your own neighborhood book club with your husband and your kids asleep upstairs. And so to bring Rue, this antagonist, into this setting, that shows a great deal of confidence on Rue's part, right? Because she's coming right into Amy's home territory where she's the most confident. And it was fun to watch Rue, like, subvert that book club, get everybody drunk, get everybody playing this college drinking game, Never Have I Ever, to very quickly have Amy realize, you know, this woman hasn't come here by random. She hasn't moved in my neighborhood by chance. She's here because she knows who I am, and she knows what I did, and she wants something from me. And so to bring that kind of energy into this really cozy space, I liked the clash of that, the clang of it. Well, it really set the book up really well right from the get-go, too. Thank you. I think it kind of makes it a little bit fun for book clubs, too, to imagine, you know, of their own secrets started coming out. Because it's not just Amy that Rue is out to expose. She she gets a lot of people talking a little bit too much. It is interesting because we are also a member of a book club at our library. And every once in a while, we get a new member. And you don't know anything about that new person. Like, you know, the people have been going there for years. You know what books they're going to like, what they're not going to like. And then you get this new person who puts a whole nother spin on it. So I thought that was great. Thank you. It was a fun scene to write. Well, Ruth seems very close to being a psychopath. Is she based on a real person? None of my characters are based on real people in one-to-one kinds of ways where you can go, Oh, there's my Aunt Susan. There's my horrifying friend, Jennifer. (laughs) But, I mean, they're all mine. 
if that makes sense. Like, none of them are me, but they come out of my history. I have a friend named Charlotte who I've known since I was a little child. We grew up together. And Charlotte says that reading one of my books is like, I've taken my family and her family and everyone we grew up with, everybody we knew and our whole town, and put it in a Cuisinart and push that button, just stirred it up. <laughs> And then she reads this book and she doesn't know any of these people. She knows none of these things have ever happened to me or I've never done any of these things. So it's just a made up story. But it's like I've dipped my fingers into that soupy mess in that Cuisinart and kind of flicked them at the story. So she might see my Aunt Susan's haircut from 1987 in one scene and then... Another character, 50 pages later, is saying something my Aunt Susan said at a family dinner, you know. So little bits of what I know about how people are get in there, but it, it, I make them all up. Well, she was an amazing character. She's a she's a red hot mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, red she hot is. mess. <laughs> she really is. That's a great way to describe her. Another theme in the book was scuba diving. You, am I correct to say that you learned how to do this while writing this book? Yes. Amy was always going to be a dive instructor because I liked the, the inherent metaphors there. You know, if you've ever dropped your sunglasses off a boat, you know the ocean doesn't give stuff back. And also it's kind of like a breathing entity. It has a heartbeat. It's There were a lot of things I could do with the ocean in terms of her past, but I never could get the diving scenes right. And about a few months in, I went to my husband and I said, baby, I have never yet had my midlife crisis. It's about time I did something really expensive and possibly life-threatening. And I think it needs to be scuba diving. Because <laughs> I need to know how to do it to write this book. And he was like, oh, I'll have that midlife crisis with you. That sounds awesome. So better than a sports car and an affair, we agreed. So we took up scuba diving and we love it. Like we're still doing it. It's not even tax deductible anymore. I can't call it research. I'm, I'm just doing it for the sheer joy of it. I have never been. I really felt like I was learning how to do it since she was teaching people. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my husband is a scuba diver. He was oh. actually the youngest certified professional scuba diver in Maryland. He has been trying to get me to go, and I just didn't have much interest in it. But after reading your book, it's like, oh, this sounds like it could be really cool. <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. It's like yoga plus plus. Like it is the most calm and present I've ever been in my body. You know, once you're comfortable in your equipment and once you have your buoyancy under control, you never stop breathing. That's the first rule. And you use your breath to change your level in the water and to move around. You get so present in your body. There's nothing to worry about in the future. You can't think about any regrets of the past. You're just fully there and it's beautiful. Like, it's like a strange world full of these amazing creatures who are just like living their little lives. Some of them get curious about you. I had a remora, you know, they're cleaner fish that attach to sharks and dolphins, come up to me and try to attach to me. He followed me all the way to the boat. He was like, I'm sure you're dirty. I can just clean you. <laughs> I was like, come on. And my oh, wetsuit was so very bad. confusing to him. It was so cute. So sometimes they'll come and interact with you. It's amazing. If you get a chance, you should absolutely do it. Now, have you done that before with books? Learned how to uh, take on a new hobby because of a book? Um, not to that degree, although I tend to be a very hands-on researcher. And I'm a very curious person. A lot of times, it's not that... I will take up an activity or an experience because of a book. It's more like I'm doing an activity and a book comes out of it. I work with a, a group called Reforming Arts, and we teach in Georgia's prison system. We teach women, Georgia's facilities for women. We're in two, I think, right now and looking to expand into a third. We're in partnership with Georgia State. And certainly that work, like working within that system, coming to understand the socioeconomic factors that play into what we think of as justice, how that system works. I would say I was already a redemption-obsessed novelist, but I have become much more so from that work, from being in that environment and meeting these people and being close with them and working with them as they try to change their lives and create opportunities for themselves that they may never have had before because the one thing my students almost universally have in common, they're all different ages, all different races, all different orientations. The one thing they have in common is they come out of grinding poverty, like hard to imagine grinding poverty. And most of them come out of really disordered family unit. That work has made me even more obsessed with like 
how we find a path to community and light and hope and redemption in this broken world. That's beautiful.